Hey everybody, it's Pete. Welcome to Stocks for Breakfast. Welcome to Stock Trading Pro. We have a massive amount of things to plan for this week. I'm very excited. We're going to actually hop right into the outline for this week. I want to make sure that everybody understands how impactful today is going to be for the week. This is going to be a massive, amazing week of trading. So let's hop right into the outline. I want to really get into this uh, in a big, big way. So we're going to talk about today. We're going to start out with I actually went to a mastermind last week. I want to break down the lessons that I learned at the mastermind this week. Three very important things. Then we're going to actually break down stocks for breakfast, which is starting out with massive earnings this week. And I want to get across, if you are an active trader, this is going to be heaven, bullish and bearish ideas, short-term ideas, plenty of action. We're also going to talk about the economic data. Jerome Powell speaking on Wednesday night, leading into what's happening on Wednesday and Thursday morning and Friday morning. There's stuff going on, all three of them. We're going to break down options for the week. And then even more importantly, we're going to work our way into the market, sector rotation, industry groups, and swing alerts. And I think probably one of the first things we should be talking about is how the market has unfolded over the last few weeks. A little bit of a pocket of opportunity here in energy stocks, but not much other than that. Now, there is one giant level that I two actually two levels that I think everybody's watching right now. One of them is in the 10 year treasury notes, which I think everybody, every podcast you could possibly be listening to has been talking about it this week. And the second one is a level in the S&P 500, which we have already cracked pre-market. This is going to be amazing the way it's going to unfold. A lot of people talking about this is going to be a short trap heading into Monday. We'll see. Plenty of stuff. But what I want to first break down is what happened last week for me. And I go to a mastermind event once every four months. It's basically uh, June, uh, February, June, and October. And it's essentially a business group of people, like minded people. And I want to share three lessons for you. And probably one of the most interesting ones is a friend of mine, uh, Joel Irway, actually wrote and published a book in three weeks. Who does that? That's the kind of people that you want to be around. So first, we're going to break down, as we said here, let me just kind of make sure we keep this up on the screen here. We're going to start out with the mastermind lessons. So I'm going to read them off to you. And it's actually going to have a lot to do with um, this book here, Think and Grow Rich. Hopefully, everybody's a big fan of Think and Grow Rich. The first one, all right? And I want you to write these down. Very, very important. Money loves speed. Write that down. Money loves speed. Now, we were talking about that from an entrepreneurial and a business perspective, but here's the thing I want to get across to you. If you are a fan of Think and Grow Rich, and especially Napoleon Hill, there's the whole story about him and Andrew Carnegie. Whether you believe that happened or not, it doesn't make a difference. Millions and millions of people have had their lives changed by Think and Grow Rich. And the quote of money loves speed basically comes down to this. If you are a active stock trader and you are analyzing things to death where you can't make a decision, you have to stop that, get all the information and just put the trade on, put your stop loss in, put your buy stop in, put your limit order in and trade with conviction. So that's the first thing. Money loves speed. When you have a ability to make fast decisions and act on them, you will find that the growth that you will have will be dramatically, dramatically different than probably what you're experiencing now. Lesson number two from my mastermind last week, failure is not the opposite of success. It is a part of it. Let that sink in for a second. A lot of people believe when they have stumbling blocks or roadblocks or they don't get exactly where they want to be as fast as possible, this is something to understand. And quite frankly, if you have a superpower or if you're looking to develop a superpower, make persistence the number one superpower you start with. Because once you understand how to overcome roadblocks, everything changes and anything is possible. So I want to read that to you one more time. Failure is not the opposite of success. It is a part of it. Write that down. Now, the last one, uh, a big part of the meeting, and this is really relevant to everybody here on Stocks for Breakfast right now. We're going to get into the best stock picks in just a second and break everything down. But the third one is the very first day of this event was a group of writers, uh, specifically copywriters, people who write promotions for stuff. Uh, some of them have been at it for 40 years. So the lesson coming out of this is these people have been doing this for 40 years or more, quite honestly, even going back into the 1970s, still learning. 
people who are considered the legend at what they do still going out of their way to learn what's working now, taking their strategies that have worked for a long time, and then looking for new tactical ways to apply those strategies. But it's not so much about the strategies and the tactics as much as people with massive success, massive experience, still trying to improve. That is something you really want to think about. So those are the three big things. Money loves speed, number one. Success and failure go hand in hand. They're not opposites. And no matter how long you've been around, if you want to master what you're doing, continue to be a voracious student. Three things. Now, let's hop into the market. We got a massive amount of stuff to talk about. So we're going to start out with um, big week of earnings. This is all going to kind of play into what's going on with which trades to take. Now, I want to be very clear. I get asked all the time, how do I personally trade earnings? How does the community trade earnings? I like to trade earnings after the fact. Now, there's certain plays where maybe a couple of weeks heading into earnings, you can put trades on, get on what we call that initial position. And then once you put that initial position on, it becomes a little bit easier to manage into earnings. Now, for me personally, I just want to give you a number. I typically only hold open positions into an earnings announcement if I have a two ATR head start on that trade. And I'm going to show you visually what that looks like. So if we take a look at Nike, uh, which is a stock that actually just reported not too long ago, you can actually see over here in the corner, $1.83 is the average true range for Nike. So let's just kind of do the basic math. So $1.83 times two is $3.60. So let's just use round numbers just to keep the math really simple. So let's say that I bought Nike at $100. If I bought it at $100 and it moved at least $3.60 in my favor, which again is two times the average true range of what the stock normally does, if you don't know what that means, average true range essentially means what the stock normally trades from the low to the high on a daily basis is the average true range. If I have at least that much of a head start on a winning trade into earnings, I kind of feel like I have a little bit of a built-in cushion on that idea. If I believe I have a good idea and I believe earnings are going to be positive, I'm going to hang on to that idea. If I have that head start, I'll hold it. If I don't have that head start, then I kind of feel like I'm, I'm in a position where I don't have my risk managed, or at least there isn't a little bit of a cushion there. So I will technically lower my position size or even get out. Now, here's where I'm actually a little bit more aggressive. We kind of have that line in the sand, and if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you know that we talk about that. In order to read the tape, there's two parts of setting up great ideas. Number one is the order flow, which is where we are shadowing institutions in and out of the hot stocks and the hot sectors that they're involved with. But the biggest challenge that people have is actually reading the tape after you've identified obvious order flows. So order flow is the bigger picture move. Reading the tape is that shorter term move. So we always kind of have that line in the sand. There's one price that tells us, is order flow still valid? Now, raise your hand if you've ever bought a stock where it was really obvious but as soon as you bought it, it was going down. That just means that you need to get a little bit better at reading that short-term price action to kind of fine-tune your entries. So for me personally, when earnings come out after the fact, and I'm going to use Nike as an example again because it's a really fantastic one, and we're also going to use Netflix as an example. And this, this is the kind of stuff you really want to write down because this is repeatable. This is tradable. This is, this is a structure that kind of puts you in charge. What I'm looking for is when that earnings announcement comes out, that is how I'm going to read the tape. So we have the catalyst, the order flow catalyst, when earnings comes out, and that kind of pushes it in a direction. Obviously, we're talking about if it goes up, we're talking about buying. That line where it opens up, that's going to be how I'm going to read the tape. So we're going to know if it's moving closer to or further away from that in a bullish or bearish manner. Now, I want to give you two examples, one that unfolded over the last month and one that just started to unfold and it's going to give you the exact price that I'm going to be watching as it unfolds. So the first one is Nike. So we just talked about Nike over here, but I want to break it down into a little bit more of a bigger picture chart. Nike has just had a atrocious year this year, and you can see where earnings came out um, on the 29th of September over here. 
Now, it's kind of interesting, and this is really where we kind of separate ourselves from really finding the good ideas where there's validation, where we got positive feedback uh, from the market. I want to say hello to Tim. Tim, good morning. Always a pleasure. Happy to have you here with us today. So this is where it got. It went from here to here, two different levels, right? Now, in my mind, I have a very, um, let's, let's call it a very healthy yellow streak on my back. I don't like to take a lot of risk. I like to take planned risk when I have positive feedback on my idea. Now, again, if you're swing trading, and a lot of the ideas we're talking about right now are swing trade ideas, it's very important that you work your way into those positions because in exchange for that overnight risk, we don't want to add more money into that deal until we start to see the stock doing what we expected. So the more positive feedback we get, we have places where we add shares in a very formulaic way. And again, if you happen to be in our community, you'll understand that, especially if you have our daily ticker newsletter. Every single trade has an entry, a stop loss, add shares price. So if it moves up a certain amount to that spot, that's where we look to add to it. It's all planned out. It's very, very easy. And then we also have an initial profit target, which is the risk versus the likely reward to put that trade on in the first place. But no matter how much we love that idea, we still work our way into that position because the overnight risk warrants that we need to put more in as we get feedback. We don't get positive feedback. We just simply stay with that position. Or if it happens to go in the other direction, we just kick it out, small loss, look for the next trade, right? So getting back to Nike and looking at the idea, you can see how it had this big gap up. Now, we already just went over the lesson of what I'm looking for. I am looking for follow-up positive feedback in the direction of the short-term catalyst, the short-term order flow, which is the gap from where it closed prior to earnings to where it opened after earnings. Now, you can see it took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days for that to happen. So I basically just sat back and I said, okay, Nike opened up up here. It's kind of drifting and slowly going the other way. I then set an alert at 99 to say, call me. <laughs> Give me a call when it gets back up to that price level. Until then, there's nothing for me to do. When it gets to that level, that means that the buyers from the gap and other people are now back in play, and I'm going to simply shadow them in that particular order flow. And then after that, we have tape reading, we have the optimal entry, and then we have managing profits, which we call the profit maximizer. But I think the biggest thing that I want to talk about here is we made a fast decision and say, no, I'm not going to chase this move. I have a certain price. Now, the next stock I want to show you is actually unfolding where it's very close to the price, but not quite ready for us to partake in it. Now, this stock has actually been in a bearish move for the better part of, I want to say, about three to five months. Earnings came out, surprise to the upside. So we have very similar chart pattern to what we're looking at in Nike now, where it was bearish, gapped up, but not a trade yet. Now, this is really, we get this question all the time. It sounds like it's active trading. Well, we did just took nine days for Nike to trigger before we started to look at the idea. So now let's look at the other one, which is Netflix. Again, don't worry about the price of the stock. If this happens to be too expensive for you, it doesn't make a difference. All of the strategies and tactics and the thought process behind it, it doesn't matter if it's a $30 stock, quite honestly. So you can actually see here's where Netflix closed prior to earnings. Here's the next day after they announced. Now, we actually got back above that level, but if you remember, the market got pummeled on Thursday and Friday. So actually, no shock that Netflix pulled back a little bit, but what we call is holding the bid. It's still holding the price. And you can actually, I'm going to show you another stock where the market actually was going down and that stock was going up against the market, known as relative strength. I'll show you that in just one second. So essentially, what we are looking for now is a strong close in Netflix above the earnings price open. And we did not get that on Friday. So now we kind of map out the trade. What is the risk reward and what is the likelihood? Well, we already have that shorter term push in Netflix to the upside. And now two days later, it's still holding. And you can see it's actually got relative strength here pre-market. Interesting, right? Not a trade yet, but interesting. So what we're looking for, if we take this price of 405.51, I believe that's right around the exact price. Um, Four, wait, where are we here? Four, 404.74. Let me actually map that out perfectly here. 
74. Let me put that in there. That's now the price that I'm going to be looking at to set my alert. If it gets back above that price and closes strong, that's giving me feedback from the difference with this gap here. Now, my initial target is going to be the place where sellers came in and shoved this stock back down, which is right around 449. So now we have to take risk that is worthy of this particular profit potential. So you can see how we're kind of setting up the ideas, right? Now, let's kind of translate this over into the big week of earnings that we have unfolding and the massive, massive economic data. Wednesday night. Now, this is a big thing. here. Now, nobody should be shocked about this. We're talking about it now on Monday. Jerome Powell is speaking after the market closes Wednesday night. And then we have massive economic data, GDP data coming out on Thursday morning. So that nightly move into the next morning at 830, GDP data and um, – uh, unemployment. And then we have Friday CPE data. But before we get into that, let's actually talk about the big earnings that you need to be aware of. Now, I purposely started talking about how I personally trade earnings. So maybe that will give you some strategic ideas on how you can trade earnings with a lot less stress where you let it come out. Then we look for that price that I just showed you and whether or not new buyers kind of step up after the fact. So let's say that Tim or Simon is in there and they're pushing it up and then lj or harry a week later like nope not yet i know exactly what i'm looking for and until that happens i'm just going to sip my coffee and be a stress-free trader it's a lot easier than you're probably making it right now but very very potentially rewarding when you get a few of those stocks to follow through now i just want to give you one idea uh to give you like a visual of why i am i am uh, watching things this way and why it's so significant to Wait for your price, but when you get it, take action. Like I said, one of the three things that I learned at the Mastermind this week, money loves speed. So I'm going to show you one stock from an earnings report that just unfolded um, recently. Where's my charts? Right there. Uh, Jabil. Now, not necessarily a massively expensive stock, but you can see what the stock actually did from the earnings gap, 111.50 to 141. That's a monster move. That is a $30 move with nothing more than waiting to see after the earnings came out. Did they follow it up with additional buying? And they did. And even if you didn't capture this entire day, you had a couple of days here to get involved, maybe even in this next move, which was good for another $13 or $14. And by the way, day trading this stock, oh my gosh, that day, I think it was like a $12 move just from this price here on the day trading side of things. So let's actually take a look at some of the earnings that are coming out this week, just so you can start to position yourself and more importantly, know when the earnings are coming out, how you now want to at least have an idea of how I just mapped that out for you. So obviously tomorrow, Microsoft and Google coming out, two big tech stocks, right? A big part of that um, conglomerate of, of uh, tech stocks everybody's watching. Visa, financial stocks have been kind of a little bit all over the place right now. JP Morgan, probably the best balance sheet. And that stock is kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere, which should really give you an idea of what's going on with the bigger picture. I don't have a bias on financial stocks right now. They're kind of stuck in the mud. I will tell you, though, as a surprise, just in case you haven't seen these kinds of stocks, for those of you that say that there isn't anything to do, insurance stocks have been really, really good from a bullish perspective over the last month or so. So if everybody who's out there right now is saying, I can't find any stocks to buy, you got to go a little bit deeper and kind of break it down into a little bit more of an industry group specific idea. And that's kind of what we do when we look over here. So you can actually see the last five weeks of the S&P 500, a lot of red across the screen, right? But if you kind of dive in a little bit deeper, there have been some financial stocks in insurance and property. Obviously, the other area that has been pretty strong, uh, this group over here, oil and gas, EMP. Um, Fang and a few of those guys, but the energy stocks, because of what's going on in the Middle East right now, adding a lot of a lot of volatility. And I've chosen in the community to not really call those ideas out as swing trades over the last two weeks because that headline can kind of trade back and forth. But these stocks have been really, really good. So kind of drill down a little bit deeper and go into insurance ideas. I believe was it CB? I think Chubb was actually breaking out as well. There's been a few of them. You can see the higher lows. Here going on, we got one, two, three, four, five. Looking to see if we're going to catch a bid here this morning. So keep an eye on those ideas 
uh, heading into the week. So let, let's continue to get through with the earnings, right? So obviously the earnings and some bigger earnings we just kind of covered, right? Later in the week, have some big ones. So that, that's actually just coming out tomorrow. But the ones I want to point out, if we zoom out a little bit further into the week on Wednesday. Now remember, we said Jerome Powell speaking Wednesday night. We'll get into that in just a second. Meta, probably the bellwether of what everybody's looking for this week as far as tech stocks. And we're going to talk about semiconductor stocks in a second and how that's playing into um, – the, uh, the AI story that's going out right now. And I got a little bit of a, a take on that. Um, so Meta coming out. And you can see here by the little moon, that means it's after hours versus pre-market. So we have Meta after hours, IBM after hours, Boeing, which I don't know if you've been shorting Boeing, if everybody understands the short side of the market. Look at this downtrend in Boeing, barely a pop. Again, you got to know when your earnings are coming out. So if you're okay with shorting the market. Now, the reason I'm bringing earnings up at the very beginning of the call is you really need to understand if you plan to hold any of these positions overnight, at least now I've given you a plan of minimum viable criteria heading into that earnings report instead of guessing, saying, do I have enough of a cushion to justify holding this? And what does that cushion need to look like? And I just I gave you my cushion at the beginning of the call. So you can see the amount of significant earnings coming out this week is gigantic. Amazon, I'm actually a little bit more bearish on Amazon right now, and I'm going to show you why. And the re I want to just kind of come off for a second, and I want to – we all know the bigger picture of the charts, right? But sometimes the, you got to read the notes within the song. I'm not musical at all. It's the only thing I can think of. Amazon has some little notes right now that are really important to pay attention to, some dis distinctions – in price action that you need to notice. And I'm going to show you why I'm bearish. It had four bearish gaps in the last four weeks. That's a significant amount of selling. So I am actually looking for Amazon to hit this most recent support level, which I have mapped out for you right now. And if it breaks that level and earnings come out or bearish, this might be a time for looking at puts on this. At least that's how I'm looking at it right now. So if we take a look at Amazon, we have a bearish gap, a bearish gap, a bearish gap, and another bearish gap, four. And actually, if you consider that, it's actually five bearish gaps. So these are massive overnight moves to the downside. And you can see the price has been kind of defending this 123 level. If it does not defend that 123 level, the next significant support is kind of in this area over here, which is way down near 104. That's a big move to the downside. So if you happen to be long Amazon with earnings coming out, just make a decision now. Remember, money loves speed. Make fast decisions. That's important. I, I just can't express this strongly enough. Trading is as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. I like to be uncomplicated. I like it to be simple. It's if this happens, then I plan to do this. So everything we're talking about this week is if this happens, then I'll do this. If this happens, then I'll do this. There's no guesswork. There's no predicting. There's no forecasting. We have all this information up to that moment of making the idea. You put the trade on, then we have to be okay with the fact that there's new decisions after that. Remember this. The ideas that got you to the trade are not going to be the same ideas after the trade. You have order flow and tape reading up to the trade. Then we have the optimal entry and trade management after it. So we have different decisions after we put the trade on. And if you're struggling in the market right now, it's probably because you have those first two decisions or the second two decisions where you're finding good ideas, but you don't know how to manage them, or you're managing trades that are not good ideas in the first place. You got to kind of put those two pieces together. All right. So now let's get into the economic data. We just kind of broke down um, all of the earnings economic data. This is really what the important part is. You can see here, Fed Chair Powell, 1635 on Wednesday. So after the market on Wednesday. Now that's that's important, but that's not really the like where the the TNT starts. Then on Thursday morning, 8.30 before the market opens, we have the big data, like they've been kind of staying away from the recession conversation, but GDP, negative GDP specifically, is the harbinger of whether or not they're going to label recession, right? I don't want it to happen, just giving everybody some insight. So you got him after hours, then 8.30, durable goods, GDP, initial jobless claims. Big volatile news coming out this week. And by the way, if you are somebody who um, has mental stops in the market where I'm just going to see what happens, 
This is not a week for mental stops as far as I'm concerned. Stops are in the market. You get stopped out, perfectly okay. Go to the next idea. Don't worry about getting stopped out. It's a part of business. It's a part of trading. There's no business on the planet that doesn't have expenses. Trading businesses have losses. They're the expense of trading. Get that in your head and stop trying to be perfect. If you're trying to have this massive 90% win ratio, you're probably stressed out of your mind and you're probably cutting your losses, your wins, excuse me, you're probably cutting your wins short. Focus more on having bigger position size and holding longer when you have a great scenario and everything else kind of balance each other out. Stop trying to have a perfect trading record. You don't need it, and it's too much stress. Learn to make these distinctions on it. It's an amazing market. Size up and hold longer versus it's a it's going back and forth, and there's no clarity. That's when you lower it a little bit, and you kind of sleep peacefully, and you don't over leverage yourself, and you take your losses quickly. As a matter of fact, we spent a lot of time on Saturday, which we have – Saturday's game plan session with swing trades, uh, stocks and options was 90 minutes. It was amazing. One of the biggest things that we talked about was holding profits for bullish ideas in a bearish market. They tend to be a little bit more quick when the market's kind of pushing down. Bearish ideas right now are getting a little bit better follow through. So right now at this moment is the bearish side of the market is the dominant side. But I want to point out the level in the in the market. So obviously we just talked about it and more numbers coming out on um, Friday morning as well. Here's the big thing with the market right now. Everybody is focusing on this level right here, which is basically 420 in the SPY. And if you're trading the S&P 500 or the, or the SPX, this 4200 level is the level. You combine the 4200 support level in the market with the 10-year treasury note, which everybody and their grandmother is talking about, right? every podcast you listen to right now, they're talking about this 10-year treasury note and five. So five is a massive level in the 10-year. 4,200 is a massive support level in the SPY. We have the perfect mix of something happening in a big way if either one of those hold or either one of those break. If they happen at the same time, if this goes above five, and the S&P 500, the SPY breaks below that 4,200 level or the 420 level, technically. And I want to show you this. The next level to the downside in the S&P 500 that I'm watching is this 407 level, which is another 12 points lower. So this is why you cannot have mental stops. If you get stopped out on an idea that you absolutely loved, big deal. Take the loss, go to the next trade, look for the next best opportunity. Lock in your losses if a trade is not following through. There's two parts of trading that will separate you from everybody else. When you get positive feedback on your idea and you still have profit potential, look to put a little more on that trade. It's the smart thing to do. You're getting positive feedback. But the opposite side of the trade, if you are getting negative feedback, stop trading from your ego. Get that trade out, lock in your loss, put that money back into an idea that is doing what you want it to do. And if you get positive feedback, add to it. The amount of people that hold an ad to losing trades is mind boggling. The comments that we get about, I've been long this stock since 2021. And when the market turned around, I, I forgot to take a loss. I couldn't take a loss. No, you chose not to take a loss. If you want to be in this game a long time, you need to respect risk. You are protecting your inventory, which is your capital. A trading loss is not an assault to your ego. You can have the perfect trade that still loses money. It's a part of the process. The whole thing that will separate you and make you different from everybody else who says, stop trading is hard. You can't make money in the market. Those people are not respecting risk, not taking a loss, and the other side of the market is they are very likely cutting their profits short because they're afraid the profits are going to be taken away. They do it completely backwards. They hope their losses come back and they're afraid that their winners are going to be taken away. You got to flip that script. Be afraid your losses will get bigger and hope your profits get bigger. That's right out of reminiscences of a stock operator. That's not, I didn't quote that. That's Jesse Livermore. Go read the book. You'll find out. Now, let's hop into the rest of the ideas for the day, right? So we're kind of breaking it down. 
earnings, economic data, mastermind lessons, options. If you are trading options, there are a lot more options trading options because premium, as John is putting in here, premium evaporates very, very quickly and it's much higher. So you're going to get, as the VIX expands, let's actually talk about that for a second. As the VIX expands, the premiums on options are going to be more expensive. But we're kind of going sideways to dancing around in the market, but the VIX is expanding. So that means that the price of options is getting more expensive, but we're not seeing directional volatility. We're kind of seeing down and sideways, down and sideways, right? So options traders have more options for ideas. You can put on trades where they don't even need to go anywhere around certain levels. So this is what we're talking about here. John is now talking about Goldman Sachs. <clears throat> excuse me, as a trade. If you want, you can actually just take a screenshot of this talking about financial stocks. Breaking this down a little bit further, talking now about um, IWM and the um, small cap stocks. They have been getting crushed. Now, what John's talking about here is the potential for a short squeeze down at this level where we broke down. So remember what we talked about before? If then, if this happens, then I want to see this happen. So IWM, the Russell, broke down. What should happen next is they should get massive follow-through. If it doesn't, you now need to make another set of distinctions. If we break down, fantastic. I'm looking for follow-through. Great. If we break down and everybody is saying this breakdown is bearish and I expect lower prices, and it does not, that's where short covering rallies happen. So short covering is when short sellers buy their stock back. They're covering the stock that they borrowed. If you're betting on it going down and it stops, buyers step up, short sellers, uh, short covering steps up, and you get two different people buying. So what John is mapping out here is we need to pay attention to that in the Russell right now. And I'll give you a little bit different perspective of that right here. You can see the big breakdown at the support. If this follows up with a candle that looks like that, that's not what you're expecting. So a breakdown, follow through, awesome, hang on, break down one of these candles, move your trailing stop down and be a professional and just kick it out if you happen to be on the short side. Let's kind of work our way over now into um, sector rotation. So if we kind of work our way over into what's going on, the bigger picture, you can actually see that there have been some pretty weak sectors. So there's actually a lot more on the short side as opposed to the long side of the market. If we kind of work our way over to bullish stack, as we talked about before, healthcare and consumer cyclical. And you're actually going to see that more in a second. But the bearish side of the market is much, much bigger. And if we kind of break this down by sector, just to give you an idea of how to start looking for some ideas, you can actually see financials quite a bit on the bearish side of things, industrials, technology, right? So you can start to see where money is kind of rotating out of right now. So if we kind of work our way over into uh, the sectors, on the bullish side of the market, not much has changed. Healthcare stocks and consumer cyclical stocks are showing the most persistence to the upside. So technically, even going sideways is showing relative strength with the way the market's kind of getting pounded right now, right? So to give you some bigger picture context, healthcare plans make absolute sense during what many would perceive to be the start of a bearish market. When interest rates go up and consumers start to spend less money, right? Spending less on discretionary items, which means the fun stuff. You've probably heard discretionary or consumer cyclical, basically the same thing. That's when we have extra money and we're spending money on those things that we maybe don't need, but we'd like. But when money gets tight, when credit gets tight, you kind of stay away from those things. Expensive electric cars, for example, right? What has this company been reporting? Tesla has now had three consecutive poor earnings reports. So what does that tell you about how the consumer is being crunched just a little bit? So when interest rates go up, we spend less money on that. But there are certain things we need no matter what, Band-Aids and healthcare plans. So we're starting to work our way over into the stronger sector and stocks in those stronger sectors. So on the bullish side of the tape, on consumer cyclical, one of those sectors that's going up in a weird way right now, but there are some pockets of opportunity Abercrombie and Fitch, one earnings report, two earnings report. So if everybody who's sitting out there right now saying, I can't find anything to do, you got to spend that extra 10 minutes. If you want me to do it for you, like I said, 
Click that link below. Get the daily ticker. This is all premium stuff that I'm, I'm kind of showing you right now. So the stocks that are in this group, Nike, we just talked about Nike. Lulu got put into the S&P 500. Urban, Abercrombie and & Fitch. And um, I believe Harry talked about this on our Saturday coaching call. Victoria's Secrets. Look at this trend in Victoria's Secrets over the last few weeks coming off the bottom. Broke this long-term trend. You want to talk about relative strength. These are the kind of things you need to notice. Came off the bottom. Remember we said breakdown. That's what you don't want to see. That's actually a good visual right there. Breakdown. What do I want to see? What don't I want to see? I don't want to see that. Rally. Pause. Inside day. Inside day. And then five days to the upside. Victoria's Secret. Short-term relative strength right now. So again, breaking down industry groups, breaking down sectors, going to find the ideas that make the most sense right now. Not shocking healthcare is going up, but certainly with the way things are going on, it is a little bit surprising with consumer cyclical, right? Good view of Humana. We talked about this earlier in the call, showing relative strength against the SPY. So look at this. The S&P going down over this period of time and Humana going up. And look at you. For those of you that think trading needs to be complicated, look at how perfectly it's holding this support level. Boom, boom. That's a simple trend line. Keep your trading simple. Now, here's the most shocking one that I think. NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA AI. NVIDIA is making the chips for AI. Hasn't really been commercially set out there. Other than faster search, re search reports, AI is not really kind of integrated yet. But this is the scary part. I want to talk about this. When a stock gaps, generally speaking, that gap fill is the next level that if it starts to head back in the other direction, the gap fill is the level. Look at NVIDIA right now. And we're talking big picture, right? You're starting to formulate how aggressive the market could or should move in either direction. The gap fill in NVIDIA from this earnings report is 305. Right now, it's battling to hold on to this trading range, which is now a five-month trading range. If NVIDIA breaks down and gets through this 400 to 405 level, the gap fill is 305. This is why I said this week cannot be traded with mental stops. This week needs to be hard stops. If you get stopped out, be an adult, lock in that loss, and then put your capital in a different idea that you like better. And we just showed you a couple of them, right? So let's talk about some other ideas. SMCI, here's the bearish gap. The stock was up 245% between earnings reports, has not been able to recover since the previous gap fighting to hold this level. And you can see the next gap is all the way down here from this report. So you got to know these levels, 4,200 in the market, five in the 10-year in the, uh, treasury, starting to formulate some ideas, right? Let's work our way down into industry groups. How about gold? How about gold? Wouldn't you think that gold would be the place to be when the market in the world is kind of feeling a little bit more skittish right now with all the stuff that's going on? So keep an eye on AEM. So here's the thing. Remember at the beginning of today's call, I talked to you about making fast decisions but being patient to wait for your price. Well, AEM broke this longer-term downtrend. The market's getting a little more scary. The world is getting a little bit more fearful of what's going on in the big picture. Well, we broke the trend here, did not get positive feedback after we broke the trend here. We actually kind of melted all the way back down. Now, there's two things unplay, unfolding here, and this is kind of exciting because it's kind of working everything in that we just talked about. Number one is the earnings coming out in a couple of days. So if you go back to the beginning of the video, I worked you through a game plan for how I look at some of these plays when earnings get reported. So earnings are coming out, and it's sitting or testing price discovery right around this 51 level. So what I am looking to do is I am waiting for an alert at 51 and waiting for earnings to come out. So two different scenarios that I'm waiting for big picture economically, gold stocks to catch a little bit of a bid, earnings to come out to if they are positive and this 51 earnings breakout, uh, excuse me, 51 price breakout. If those things unfold, I will then take a look at AEM as an earnings gap trade and the fact that it broke that longer term bearish order flow and the fact that price discovery got it through 51. So this is if, you, if this happens to be new to you, it sounds like, oh, my gosh, that's a lot. No, I want reasons to choose to accept risk. And you should, too. You should say, and I want to buy it because of this. And I want to buy it because of this. And I want to buy it because of this. 
I want the market is is the market going up? Is the sector going up? Are other stocks in that industry going up? Fantastic. If that's happened, now let's go to the second part and determine how to manage risk and what is the right initial position size? What is the right initial profit target that justifies the risk? I just want to leave you with this. This is the most important thing I think that we're going to talk about. You can see how jazzed up I am. This for an active trader, this is going to be an amazing, amazing week of trading. And I'm ready for it. And I hope you're ready for it. If what we're talking about here is a little bit beyond what you do now, I just want you to write these four things down. Number one, did I build an argument for the idea? Number two, what is the likely reward for this idea? So when I say build an argument, how many reasons can you put into that idea that you want to be a buyer of that stock? Number two, where you are at that moment, what is the next likely move? And that next likely move is going to be the profit potential that justifies the risk for putting on that trade. We all know that as a stop loss. So if you buy it here and it goes down here, you're going to kick it out. But if that reward justifies the risk, that's worth putting the trade on, or at the very least, putting on the start of a trade. It's kind of interesting. I actually spoke to somebody over the over uh, last week when I was away, somebody not necessarily experienced in the market, but somebody who is a risk taker, taking on massive mass amount of risk for their skill level and for what they know about the market. Nobody should ever do that. You want to work your way into gaining your skill, and then you learn how to accept more risk, which is kind of what we're talking about right now. So we have arguments for the idea. We have likely profit potential from that moment you're about to hit that buy button. We have acceptable risk, which is justified because of the likely profit potential. And then the last part, I think, is probably the most exciting part, which is how to manage winning trades. And it's probably one of the things that makes us the most unique and different, and I think superior, because we have a very structured way of managing winning trades where sometimes there's faster profits, but when everything's lining up, oh my gosh, those wins are amazing. And they kind of wipe out all those annoying small losses that we just talked about. And that's the easy part of trading is putting those pieces in place. The part that you might need to learn a little bit, maybe you want me to do it for you. Like I said, you could click down in that description, at least learn what we do. Um, once you have that mapped out, trading is probably a lot less stressful than you're making it right now. And the stock market is probably a lot less overwhelming and I want to leave you with this. When you know what you're looking for, you're never lost. So you have this roadmap, like this kind of visual that you put over the market, and it's either there or it's not. If it's there, go get them. If it's not and you still trade, shame on you. That's on you. That just means you need a little bit more patience. All right. Thank you so much for joining me here today, everybody. I really appreciate it. If this is the first time you're watching this kind of video from me, Stocks for Breakfast, do me a favor. If we did a good job, give us a thumbs up and um, hit that uh, subscribe button so you get future videos. Um, and look, we got tremendous trading unfolding this week. There's a lot going on. Be prepared and take advantage of it. And you'll be very, very happy that you kind of elevated yourself uh, and you're going to separate yourself from everybody else that says trading is hard. It's not hard. It just needs to be structured. And that's kind of what we do. All right. Have an awesome week, everybody. I will speak to you soon. Thanks so much for joining me.